the times were good, with prosperity, leisure and plenty, or whether they were bad amid the horrors of trench warfare in Flanders, the pictorial history of mankind has always recorded the deeds of settled societies. There are plenty of pictures to show how villagers and townsfolk relaxed and made merry, or how they brawled and quarrelled. Plenty of illustrations to show the huge castles that they built and extended, or the countless battles in which they fought and died. We know how they tilled their meagre fields and how they built their sumptuous palaces, but always, whether in Europe or in Asia, we only see members of ordered, settled societies. The dramatic collapse of the Roman Empire, depicted so graphically in these 19th century illustrations, has usually been portrayed as part of the destruction of advanced and complex civilizations by savage and brutal barbarians during the early centuries of the Christian era. Yet the invaders did not only destroy. After the fall of Rome upon the ruins of the past, the barbarians went on to construct new and enduring societies of their own. Some elements of these societies, such as the Church of Rome, were traditional, but others were new, above all the social system, later known as feudalism, which exalted the warrior class above all others. Unfortunately, so little has survived from this period that reconstructing the story of the end of the ancient world in detail is unusually difficult. That's why historians called it the Dark Ages. Two thousand years ago, about the time of Christ, societies with advanced economies and high cultural achievements stretched in an almost continuous belt across the southern half of the continents of Europe and Asia, from the shores of the Pacific to those of the Atlantic. Around the Mediterranean, the Roman Empire was consolidated by the Emperor Augustus, who died in AD 14. Under his successors, new imperial frontiers were established in Germany and Britain, the Balkans and in the Near East. Further Roman expansion eastwards was checked by the Parthian Empire. During the second century AD, Rome attacked Parthia resolutely but unsuccessfully. The legions won several victories, but they never remained long enough to consolidate their success. Parthia and her eastern neighbor, the Kushan Empire, endured. In 226, these two states were united under a Persian dynasty, the Sasanians, which soon levied tribute from as far away as Syria and the Punjab, and created a glittering civilization that lasted 400 years. About a century after the Sasanian takeover in Persia, a new empire emerged in India, the Gupta dynasty, with their capital at Patna on the Ganges, created a state which stretched from the Punjab to Bengal. The suzerainty of Chandragupta I, who died in 330, was accepted by areas far beyond. By that time, the great days of the Han dynasty in China were over, and their possessions were fragmented between a number of weaker kingdoms. But in their prime, the Han had ruled a state that equaled the Roman Empire in population and territorial extent. Rulers such as the Emperor Wu Di advanced China's frontier to the Tarim Basin on the borders of Parthia. The existence, or rather the coexistence, of these great empires meant that vast areas of the old world enjoyed internal peace and efficient government. These conditions made possible the growth of trade on a scale never seen before. For the most part, it was internal trade between one province and another, but there was also long distance trade by sea and by land. Merchandise flowed freely, particularly from east to west. Expensive and lightweight goods like silks and spices would be transported by caravan or ship, like these still trading in the Indian Ocean. In return, gold and silver, mostly in coins, moved eastwards in large quantities. Between the frontiers of Rome and China, the Kushan and Parthian empires both willingly fostered this trade, maintaining and garrisoning the roads,
protecting the caravans and thriving on the tolls. The effects of these far-flung trading links were not merely commercial. Different cultures, too, came into contact. Thousands of people, sailors, camel drivers, merchants, porters, traveled through the bazaars of Asia from China to the Caspian Sea and from southern India to Syria. There were also missionaries. Buddhism spread from India towards the Far East. Christianity was implanted in southern India, the so-called Church of St. Thomas, and in Central Asia, the Nestorian Church. By AD 100, there was an almost continuous chain of advanced, prosperous, and ordered societies, stretching from China on the Pacific through India and Persia to the Mediterranean, virtually a Roman lake. Yet four centuries later, every one of these civilizations was in ruins and the transcontinental trade was at an end. What went wrong? Part of the answer lies in the fact that the areas to the north of this belt of civilization were the domain of nomadic tribesmen. They lived on horseback, just like their descendants, the Kyrgyz of Afghanistan, following their sheep and cattle from one grazing ground to the next on the arid plateau and inhospitable mountainsides of Central Asia. As long as adequate pasture could be found, all was well. But if there were too many animals for the available grass, or if the climate changed for the worse, conditions for the nomads quickly became desperate. They were forced either to move into the neighboring areas of more settled farming society or die. The margin between subsistence and starvation was narrow. Without warning, raiders from the steppes would appear, plundering and destroying all they could. But usually they withdrew as swiftly as they came. But after 100 BC, the attacks of the nomads became increasingly ferocious and frequent. New defensive measures would be required if the civilized world were to survive. Under the Han Emperor Wu Di, who died in 87 BC, China had suffered repeated attacks by strong bands of raiders from the north. The emperor's response had been to extend and improve the Great Wall, defended by hundreds of thousands of troops. As long as the soldiers could be paid, his strategy worked well. The Roman Empire faced similar pressures some two centuries later, and it responded in similar ways. The emperor Domitian, in about AD 85, erected a chain of frontier defenses between the Rhine and the Danube against the German tribes. His successor Hadrian did the same in Britain against the Scots. Hadrian's Wall, an impressive combination of ramparts, ditches and roads between the Solway Firth and the Tyne, ran for 73 miles and contained 27 major forts. Other emperors constructed more forts in North Africa against possible attack by tribesmen from the desert. From time to time, the legions also attacked, invading new lands, capturing prisoners whom they enslaved, and booty. Their successful achievements in the Balkans were proudly recorded on Trajan's Column, erected in Rome about AD 115. Here the legionaries appeared as the gallant defenders of the Roman way of life. But their role and their image soon changed. Now that there were so many soldiers, the cost of their wages soon grew out of hand. There could be no reduction in numbers, for that would leave the defences along the exposed frontiers dangerously undermanned. And in the third century, attacks on the frontier became more frequent, so that the size of the army had to be increased. The wage bill expanded in proportion, and any delay in payment could produce a mutiny. Not surprisingly, new taxes were levied, and existing taxes were increased in the sustained attempt to keep the troops at their posts. Similar problems were experienced in Han China, where unpopular new taxes were introduced. But whereas China was self-sufficient, Rome imported vast quantities of goods from India and Persia, not only luxury goods such as spices and jewels, but also the exotic animals required for the contests in the Colosseum. The cost of all this was constantly rising. 
so was the cost of basic foodstuffs. A measure of wheat, which cost six drachmas in the first century AD, rose to 200 drachmas in AD 276. 9,000 in 314, 78,000 in 334, and later to more than two million. Nevertheless, Rome never experienced the massive peasant tax revolts which periodically racked the Chinese Empire. In AD 184, a rising known as the Revolt of the Yellow Turbans began in the upland provinces of Sichuan and lasted for 30 years. By the time it was over, power in China lay in the hands of regional military leaders, where it remained for more than three centuries. The strength of the empire was further weakened by the outbreak of plague in China in AD 162, spreading westwards along the transcontinental trade routes until it hit the Mediterranean world in 165. Loss of life from this epidemic was substantial. But one must not write off the Roman Empire too soon. Marcus Aurelius, seen here, was emperor at the time of the Great Plague. Yet as his column in Rome proclaims, he still managed to lead his legionaries to victory against enemies beyond the Danube. There were adversaries as there always had been, but the might of Rome was still a match for them. Yet, as time passed, external pressures increased, prompting the Emperor Diocletian in the late 3rd century to reorganize the imperial government on more authoritarian lines, and leading his successor Constantine in the year 330 to found a massive new city on the Bosporus, Byzantium, later renamed Constantinople. It quickly became the empire's eastern capital, a new Rome, full of spacious squares and monumental architecture. The division of the empire into two halves, centered on Rome in the west and Byzantium in the east, had taken place by the time the barbarians struck again. Only one capital was to survive. These are the Kyrgyz tribesmen, still proud of the horsemanship that made them masters of the plains of Asia. It was their distant ancestors who, in the fourth century of the Christian era, terrorized and overturned so many settled societies and empires of the old world. At first sight, their destructive powers seem surprising, for they were primarily shepherds. The nomads of Central Asia, then as now, patiently followed their sheep in summer and sheltered in the great skin tents known as ewerts in winter, the livestock and the ewerts making up the greater part of their wealth. Other possessions were necessarily few, since nomads must carry around with them all that they own. Bracelets, bangles and other jewels were among the few luxuries permitted, for they were portable. So were their weapons, and the nomads' short bows, their lances and their sabers were terrifyingly effective in battle. Their speed and striking power could seldom be matched by their more settled neighbors. In effect, they formed vast confederacies of mobile cavalry armies. Their recorded expansion began in the year 304, when an Asian people known as the Xiong Nu broke through the Great Wall of China. They soon sacked China's two great northern capitals, Luoyang and Chang'an. For the next two and a half centuries, China north of the Yangtze River was dominated by a succession of invaders from the steppes, and there was widespread devastation and depopulation. Somewhat later, another branch of the same group of tribes, known in Western sources as the Huns, swept westward through Asia. By AD 370, they had broken into South Russia. Their arrival threw the Germanic tribes in the area into turmoil, for as they advanced, they impelled the Visigoths, previously settled in the Crimea and the Ukraine, to invade the Roman Empire in search of security. In 376, the Visigoths, perhaps 80,000 in number, occupied Bulgaria. Two years later, in a pitched battle at Adrianople, they defeated and slaughtered several Roman legions. The victorious invaders moved on towards Italy. For a time, the legions held them back, but at last the Visigoths broke through, and in 410, they stunned the world by capturing and sacking Rome itself. Moving on again, they established the kingdom of Toulouse, covering southern France and most of Spain. While Rome's forces were withdrawn to defend Italy, other Germanic tribes seized the opportunity to cross the frozen Rhine. The Vandals, the Alans, and the Swaves invaded Gaul in 406, 
and plundered it for three years before passing on to do the same in Spain. In 429, the Vandals overran Roman North Africa. Carthage fell in 439, and in 455, the Vandals sailed across to Rome, which, like the Visigoths before them, they captured and looted. Once again, the empire's northern frontiers were left unguarded. Once again, Gaul was invaded, this time by the Burgundians and Alemanni, who settled in the southwest, and by the Franks, who occupied most of the north. Britain was attacked by waves of Jutes, Angles and Saxons from the Baltic lands. By about 440, they seemed to have gained a permanent footing in southeastern England. London ceased to be a Roman city. The Romans were forced to make concessions and even to pay bribes to the invaders in order to buy a temporary truce. That a more resolute policy might have preserved the empire was shown by the defeat of the last great invasion led by Attila the Hun. In 451, the Huns crossed into northern Gaul, but the Roman forces secured the support of both the Franks and the Visigoths, and in a great battle near Chalons, the Huns were defeated. Later in 451, they streamed into Italy, but stopped short of Rome. Instead, they retreated to the Balkans, where in 453, Attila died. Chaos reigned until the Ostrogoths, another Germanic tribe led by Theodoric the Great, moved westwards into Italy in 488 and created a stable kingdom that was to last for half a century. Meanwhile, further east, another branch of the Huns, known as the White Huns, burst across the Hindu Kush. In 480, they destroyed the Gupta Empire in northern India. In 484, they overran much of Persia and killed the Sasanian ruler in battle before settling in Rajputana and becoming Hindus. By the end of the 15th century, much of Central Asia was in chaos. So was much of the Roman Empire. The West was shattered into tiny pieces. There were Franks and Burgundians in Gaul, a Visigothic kingdom in Spain, and an Ostrogothic kingdom in Italy. In Britain, small Anglo-Saxon states were installed in southern and eastern England. In North Africa, the Vandal Kingdom remained a force to be reckoned with. Everywhere, the invaders sought to share in the benefits of Roman civilization, combining the Roman way with their own. But there were still Roman emperors. Now, however, they ruled not from Rome in the west, but from Constantinople, or Byzantium, the eastern capital. And under the greatest of the Byzantine emperors, Justinian, the imperial heritage was preserved and even expanded. At the time of Justinian's accession, in AD 527, Byzantine possessions were confined to the eastern Mediterranean. By the year of his death, in 565, however, his forces had reconquered North Africa, the islands of the west, and much of Italy. But it did not last. For a final wave of Asiatic peoples, the Avars entered Europe after about 550 and sowed a new path of desolation through Gaul, Italy and the Balkans. In their wake came other warlike tribes who carved out and settled large areas of the old Roman world. The Slavs in the Balkans and in Eastern Europe, the Lombards in Northern Italy and the Bulgars who colonized what is today still called Bulgaria. In Asia, the effects of the barbarian invasions were not as lasting as in Europe. In spite of the devastation in China, it's surprising how much of classical civilization had survived by the time the empire was finally restored, after 581, by the Sui and Tang dynasties. Although North China suffered terribly, even the use of money disappeared, and there was a reversion to a primitive barter economy, South China escaped. In fact, vast numbers of Chinese fled from the north to the south. Furthermore, the invaders in the north used Chinese methods of government and cooperated with the local gentry and administrators. They were eventually absorbed into the Chinese system, adopting Chinese customs and culture. The same was true of the invaders of India. The Rajputs, who still inhabit Rajputana in the northwest, are descendants of the Hun invaders of the 5th century. 
They were absorbed into the Indian caste system and converted to Hinduism, enriching a sophisticated artistic and literary culture. But a veil of darkness falls over most of Indian history between the invasion of the Huns and the foundation of the Sultanate of Delhi in the 12th century. Western India seems to have been almost permanently racked by wars between lesser rulers. Southern India also saw internecine war, combined with periodic but unsuccessful attempts to invade Ceylon. Northern India was likewise fragmented, with occasional wars against Persia. By the year 600, the world had vastly changed. Empires had been overturned and their civilizations partially forgotten. In Western Europe, knowledge of Roman classical writers was preserved only in a handful of monasteries. Even lines of communication and ancient trading links were cut. No carts or chariots and no legionaries now traveled along the Roman roads. The great cities, the foremost symbols of classical civilization, were prostrate. Rome was now a desolate place of vast ruins, its great forum silent, the aqueducts cut, grass growing all around. Of course, life continued, and farming remained the basis of societies and states alike. All over the West, people withdrew from the cities to the countryside. But the units were small, isolated and vulnerable, and our knowledge of this society is limited. We do not know, for example, the exact date on which the Visigoths sacked Rome in 410. Was it the 14th of August or the 24th? The records are ambiguous. And why did Attila not sack Rome in 451? Was it really the personal intervention of Pope Leo I, who, according to legend, threatened the leader of the Huns with divine vengeance if he advanced further? Again, we do not know. But just as Europe recovered and forged new political and social systems, the rest of the old world was rocked by the rise of a new world religion, Islam. By destroying the Sasanian Empire of Persia and absorbing its wealth, by robbing the Byzantine Empire of its richest provinces, and by advancing to the Chinese frontier in Central Asia, Islam completely changed the balance of world power and became unquestionably the most dynamic civilization of its day. It was a turning point in world history. Although the gains of the classical period were never entirely lost, there was a marked reduction in contacts between East and West. The disciples of the Prophet Muhammad drove back the nomads, but the various Muslim states that they created constituted a barrier to cultural interchange that was no less formidable. Europe was thrown back on its own resources to fend for itself. For the present, and for a long time to come, the focus of world history lay elsewhere. <laughs>